like to introduce the other side of me, which is that I'm also a father of six and 16 grandchildren counting, one more on the way. And uh, that's, um, you know, really what I'm proud of the most is that they actually turned out all right. <coughs> and they all went through college. And they all have homes and businesses and spouses. And, and it's working out so far pretty good. So I'm really happy about that because being Asperger's myself, I didn't really, and coming from a family of multiple disabilities, all kinds of things going on in my family. I had eight siblings. And all kinds of mental illness, uh, learning disabilities, alcoholism, you name it, we had it. I say we I always say we're like the candies without the money. You know? <laughs> Only other people get that joke, by the way. But anyway, uh, what I'm gonna try to do is break the ice for you here and sort of uh, go over. So uh, that up there is my presentation. And uh, you're gonna learn what it all means there. So I'm going to just go right through it and try to stay on time here. You're going to give me the one minute? It's a two minute. Okay, good. I need that. And so I want to talk about, first of all, the uh, made for good purpose. And what, that's our sort of our motto of our program. You're made for good purpose. You're inherently valuable. You're not disabled. You're, you're not dysfunctional. Uh, you know, you basically have a different learning process that's different than the norm. And so that's really important as far as your understanding of yourself. So what I say is that there's like four or five steps. First of all, you have to be aware. When I start to become aware of my learning difference, and then I need to understand it, so I have to study it and say, what is that approach? How does that affect me? And then accept it. Like, okay, I truly have this. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a death sentence. It actually helps me understand my second grade, lots of other problems in my life and good things too. And then learn how to self-disclose and self-advocate. Stephen's written a great book on self-disclosure and self-advocacy. And, and then the last stage you get to go to is where I'm at now, which is self-determination. I get to take my skill set and know that I can adopt, if I use the learning in the program, and what I you know, learned writing the curriculum, then I can actually navigate the world pretty well all over the world and do lots of things I never could do before in the last 12 years. That's why we have CIP, otherwise it would be one little tiny program in the Berkshire still. But it's all over because I opened up to the world instead of staying in my box. So the second one there is a little pyramid and, it's, and that's the learning pyramid. And this is the way it really works. So for example, if we sit here and lecture you, which we're gonna have to do tonight, but we we'll break it up into 15 minute segments, so at least you're having a little more interest than you would you know, if I was just talking the whole time. There's only 5% retention rate to that. So that's the top of the pyramid. If I read to you, maybe, or you read, it might be 10%. If, uh, if there's audio-visuals, you know, maybe uh, it will be 30%. And then demonstrations, if I demonstrate a skill to you, maybe 30 40%. And then if you get to uh, practice, 75%, and if I actually have you teach each other, like I have these two students teach each other a skill, 90% retention rate. So what does that say for us? It says that, and parents, you guys know that, when you have your kid, you can only teach them to a certain age, and then they just don't listen to you anymore, right? They have to have Mrs. Gilfrey or Mr. Schwartz or whatever do it, and they listen to them, and they learn better, right? And that's really what happens. And so uh, the, uh, the thing is to uh, let go of that at this point and find, so you become not a teacher anymore with your child. You become a facilitator, which is what our staff are now. They're facilitators. They set up interactions where students can teach each other or learn from each other and in, in, in situations where they'll learn in a better way, in a real life, in a, in, a, in a community, at a real bank, not in an office learning banking. You know what I mean? So we do everything in vivo as much as possible in the community. And that's the learning period we move on. What's the next one? Social interpersonal skills. Those are the most important skills because those are the glue. You can be the smartest one at NYU in medicine or whatever, and you can still not be married and still not hold a job. 
So that's the problem. The social, everything is a social relationship. Going to the bank, I have a long story I tell about that, but you just have to read it in the book if you want to read it. Because I never talked to anyone in the bank, and then after my brother moved there, he's talking to everyone, and they come in and they start talking to me about my life, but I never talked to them for like six years. And so they're telling me things about me, and I said, well, what's going on here? Because he had a, the most, a social relationship with one of the two weeks, and I didn't have one in six years. So it's a glue. It's the glue. Let's move on. Person-centered planning is the next one. And portfolios. So no one is too young to build a portfolio, whether you're having a, you know, want a skateboard contest or, uh, or publish a little joke in your school uh, newsletter or whatever. You want to keep, you want to keep those things because they add to the body of work that you're doing. No job is too small, no volunteer job is too small to put in there. Those are all experiences that add to your portfolio. So you want to build portfolios like Temple Grandin says. Build portfolios of your work so you can show people what you do. So who saw the movie Temple Grandin? Okay, so if you haven't seen it, you should see it. My favorite part is when she goes up to the three, uh, you know, slaughterhouse guys, and she's showing them. She pulls out her pictures of her model of these how a slaughterhouse should be built. It's like a spiral thing. It's really cool. And she and she got their attention. Then she starts to explain how it's going to save them money, how less cows are going to get killed in the process, and how it's going to be kosher and everything else in the world. And then she had them sold, right? But as she walked in there and applied for a job at that place, what would they have said to her? They'd say, who's this weird woman walking in here? Get her out of here. And just make an excuse to tell her the position's built and get her out of here. That's what would happen. What would she I mean, that's literally what would happen. And if she, when she brought her portfolio, showed them the work that she could do. So that's so important. And you move on. I don't think I'm going to do that. Oh my god. Okay, so the next one is the eight skills for work. These are communication, teamwork, problem solving, initiative, leadership, planning, organization, self management, a willingness to change and learn, and technology. Those are the most important ones, and they're all in a chapter in this, which is our new curriculum that's been out for about six or eight months. And uh, I want to say that I just, we have a contract publish the work that goes with that that's based on those eight skills, each chapter, and they're all experiential it's for transition. And we're doing that now, Steve. Have you written forward for that one too? Yeah. Well, you might not. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, I don't think it has a forward because it's a workbook. It's like a preface. But anyway, uh, the next important area is community integration. And that, I mean that we are in the process with CIP at all of our centers of making our staff get these students. Everyone has an internship of some kind. Everyone's in the community doing as much as possible, whether it's community service, whether it's um, shopping, you know, everything is done in the community and so that they have learned normatively. Because when they leave, they have to, if you go to NYU, it's nice to get a great degree. Do you learn how to do all that stuff for you? No, so that's the problem. You could be a brainiac and not know how to shop for your or pay your rent or do all these other things that are really vital to your existence. So you have to do both at one time. Okay, over to you. Seven is universal values. Teach both uh, performance and relational values. Not only to be up time in the job, but the relationship values. How do you treat people? How do you talk to them? What's the, you know, what, how do you do all of that? And I'm going to cut, cut, cut through a few of them so I can spend more time again. Uh, peer mediation process is P and P, and that's for conflict resolution. You have to teach that. It's not going to come normal. Like how do two roommates decide who's going to use, who's going to watch the television show tomorrow? How do they decide that? How do you decide those things in in every area of your life? You know. So uh, my spouse had a change of offices and was able to negotiate getting an office with a window rather than being put in a room without a window. But it was a very delicate process because everyone else held rank. So you have to you have to learn those skills. You can come in valuable in life. 
So the next one, number nine, is curriculum integration. In other words, if you took this book and you wanted to integrate it into your school or program, how could you do it? You could do it in a couple of different ways. One is by a dedicated class or course that you had, you know, if you wanted to have it in your, in your program. Or you could do it uh, by um, interspersed integration throughout the curriculum. You could uh, teach all your teachers and have them do aspects of it in all their classes, which is what we do at CIP. We do have specific classes in certain areas, but we do also have everyone trained in it. And then assessment and evaluation is the next one. And why? Why do you have assessment and evaluation? Because, for example, let's take a normal one that most colleges and most programs, with Asperger's at least, don't do, which is sensory integration. They don't do a profile. How do you know what kind of learner you are? How do you know what your strengths are and, and um, all your sensory issues? So Stephen always told a story about when he was kind of trying to be an accountant and he went to the accounting job and they put him in a little cubicle. Uh, I don't know if I screw up, you can correct it later. But he rode his bicycle there and he was a little sweaty and he put it in the furnished room or something. But it just didn't work out because they didn't, you know, he was trying to, they were trying to accommodate him and he just was trying to fit into this process that was not a good sensory environment for him, basically. So you have to be able to know what things you do. Like, I made my son stop the car and took a walk, a little walk and got out of the car. What do you have? Because I said, I need to do that and I need to go to eat something before we start here tonight. Because it's late afternoon and my sensory issues start to go all over the place. You didn't give me that too long, too. It's okay. We'll get there. Uh, so the next, the next one is in their own words. That's, we have a, a section in the book. This is really, I'm talking about the whole book. That's what I've been talking about, in case you didn't know. And so in the book, we have students who wrote and staff who wrote in their own words articles. We also have the next one where it says blah, blah, blah. That's the expert speak chapter where Stephen has something in there. And, and uh, my son has something in there. There's a lot of people that have really nice articles in there to read. So, And the next one says 12. It is the 12 chapters of the book, which I just went through with you. Um, and the next one, the sombrero, is something that's changed since I did this slide. So the sombrero was our training program in Mexico, but we switched it. And now it's uh, February 4th. For the week of February 4th at Kropalu Center, which is a holistic yoga center in the Berkshires. And it's going to be there. It's a leisure and learn program, which means you work with us from 9 to 2. It's for professionals, educators, psychologists, and parents. And you come and you basically learn about this curriculum and how you apply it in transition. If you want to like a mini master's in transition, that's what you can come for. And then what happens is after two, you do yoga eat their wonderful food throughout the day, which is amazing. And then you go in the lab and it's in a beautiful setting overlooking the Stockbridge Bowl, which is a lake in Stockbridge, Mass. And really, really beautiful farming. So we're paired up with them to do this. It's going to be awesome. I'm really excited for that. And that's February 4th. And if you sign up, or well, if you have, you probably have your email, so you can probably get something on that. The next one, which is the CIP, was it really stands for constantly in progress, which is what one of our graduates said in Florida, who's now a staff member for our program. He said that's what it stood for him when he gave a speech. And I thought, that's really great, the fact that you're a lifelong learner. Because I'm a slow, one of the parents I was talking to beforehand, I said, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a really slow learner, and I'm a very, I'm just a late bloomer. I look like I was about 14 when I was 35. And really seriously, and so I had to learn the hard way. I had to keep making mistakes over and over and over. And so, if I didn't see the world as constantly in progress, I wouldn't probably give it up because I was way behind my my peer group. You know, I was like, how do these guys date? I don't know stuff I can't do. Anyway, last thing I just want to say to think positive: is the glass half full or is it half empty? You could argue either way. But I say I always go on the side of you know, there's enough negativity in life without staying in that group. So you may as well try to find the goodness and everything and build on that. So, and that's part of our work, right? We look for the skills that these students have and try to build on that. And they've had enough crap going on in their lives that they don't need that anymore. They need to be told when they're 
what they could do right, and shown through assessment and work what they could do. And I'm going to pass with that. Thanks for listening.